I'm Hiko, and the, you're watching Thorin's YouTube. Right, this is going to be another episode of Daring Minds, the show where now we dare to not even have guests, even though, realistically, you're not even like the most established person in Valorant, and I am nobody in Valorant, so we, we are definitely pushing the bot out by attempting to do an episode without guests, but that's the other thing. I also do want to actually, this is the one of the tricky parts about doing these shows, is I'll say straight up to you, because if you haven't noticed, one of the ways I do it is I sort of break the fourth wall in my shows, because I just find it, like, it's not, it's like we're not a real TV show, we don't have to hide all the shit from the fans, you know. So, like, one thing I tried to do on my shows, obviously, is whoever my co-host is, I want to, like, feature them their knowledge and bring them into convos and stuff. But I will say the one issue is this. You're actually like a tiny bit too British and too polite because I'm used to like, remember it's normally like Monty Cristo or like Richard who's like, I don't have okay. to ask them to talk. They're just going to jump in whenever they want, you know, like. So like sometimes, you know, if we have a guest, it can dominate the convo a little bit, but it's all oh, you yeah. now, baby. It's all you. It's your, mm. it's your platform. It's your platform. Oh, you're so kind. The yeah, camera, well, usually when we up. bring people in, I let them talk. I didn't, yeah, I didn't realize that was a bad true. thing. <laughs> no, no, in, listen, in general, you're doing a good job, but, I, but just essentially, if you ever want to say something, just jump in whenever you feel like it. Don't worry about it. Also, we have, we've leveled the production up. Well, part of it. Like, her camera looks great. Mine, because I've had to, I also do like to generally make the people look equally sized. So normally I'm a bit smaller, right? So now I do, just because it's full, we're in the full summer now, I do just look like a gammon completely. I am like red. <laughs> That's because I'm not, I'm not a master of cinematography. I don't know the light set up or what it's shade I'm uh, supposed to use. You're nearing your 40s. That's what it is. Could be. It's like Could a rite be. of passage. <laughs> it is. To some degree, I definitely don't tan. That should go without saying. Right, let's get into the topic because obviously VCT Masters was ongoing the last few weeks. The same way I wanted to do an episode last week, even though we didn't have a guest, because like to me, those are like the, I mean, there's only bloody like three of them in a year, so we got to cover these. Like, if we don't cover these, what's the point in going balls deep on like fucking VCT online qualifier to get into the stage that gets you to this land? Like, it's a bit silly. So let's just start at the top, right? I, I, I forget. No point beating around the bush. Let's start with the winners, right? The yeah. winners, obviously are even by the way one of our first guests was Ardis from FBX yeah. we had him all that way back and if you go back and watch that episode he was a very confident person like he not only thought Europe was the best he thought NA is overrated he thought his team were the shit by the way a lot of this is fucking aged very well thought Angel was great now obviously the crazy thing with this team like I mentioned on the last episode is they should have been at the previous Masters but didn't get to go hence Team Liquid replaced them and this time around it's crazy they've won because they didn't even know they'd have their real team there like what if the Sigetsu guy doesn't even make it yeah, there he doesn't get the I, visa the the whole, the whole story, I think I tweeted this the other day. I was like, I'm pretty sure the, the story of FPX is probably the coolest story we've had. And I put in Valorant history so far, and there was definitely someone who got really pissy about me saying Valorant history because Valorant's really new. And I was like, that's why I put so far. Yeah, like, yeah. What? It, has, it hasn't existed for three days. Like, it's still two years. Fine, like, yes. we'll take what we can get. Um, But no, really, like, the, the whole story of the fact that they had all of this shit, like, the shit doesn't even go back to just the last Masters event, but actually the regular season before then, because they were playing with a sub for the, all of the playoffs of that. Like the whole bracket, they had a sub come in. He subbed in for Angel, who is their IGL. And then also he had to sub in for Ardis after that. So they had a sub who was covering two different roles, very different roles on the team, still got them to the grand finals of that bracket and still won those that grand finals. And that's what qualified them for Reykjavik. And then they couldn't go to Reykjavik uh, because of the, the visa problems and artists had COVID. They couldn't like have a three out of five. Oh, that was um, right. Yes, he had that test thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and so and so they could not field three out of five of their players and therefore they had to not go. They were given like a consolation prize, essentially. They got some circuit points. They got some of the prize money. But like one of the really big things that we've spoken about on this podcast especially is how much like Valorant changes and the unpredictability of the teams who end up qualifying for things, right? Like there are yeah, very yeah. few teams who have consistently qualified for these events. So you miss an event, like it's entirely possible you're not making the next one. Um, at least that's how Valorant is right now. And so they had to face that with also the whole Ukraine issue still being a problem. Oh, sure, and yeah. therefore, you know, that you know, all of that yeah, shit. Yeah. They qualify and yeah, and then you find out Sugetsu can't, come at least not for the group stages because of visa problems they didn't think Shao. it was actually crazy that Shao, who is also russian got his visa in time like he narrowly narrowly got the visa in right. time and angel i think it was angel who said um that 
they only got one one day of practice before the group stages of playing with the actual roster who was going to be competing because they had been practicing with two subs, assuming that Shao wouldn't be able to make it. Right. So they had like right. one scrim day with the actual fucking roster. And then you just got to hope that Sugetsu is going to make it. But even before you hope that Sugetsu is going to make it, you got to hope that you actually managed to make it into the fucking playoffs in the first place. And they yes. were like in ostensibly the easier group. But, you know, D they were with DRX and DRX um, beat them in the group stage. Um, but also, you know, their first game was against Zersha, the Thai team. And that was like a, a uncomfortably close game for FBX. So it was, a, I don't want to say it was like a bad group stage for them, but it wasn't like a super impressive group stage. Their round differential was zero. So like of all the teams that qualified in for the playoffs from the group stage, they did the worst. Um, so all of that was exceptionally precarious. And then Sugetsu finally manages to come in. And this is a young player. Sugetsu's 20. Um, and I, as far as I'm aware, he doesn't have LAN experience. Um, and he comes in and you think like, okay, it's a young player. Like there's a lot of pressure on him. Like, is he really going to be able to, you know, what are you going to do with this? This is kind of a crazy situation. The man fucking pops off. Like, what the hell? Young players don't do that. Like, it's so rare to see young players actually be able to pull that off, especially in a situation um, like as crazy as that. Like, the, the mitigating circumstances here is actually wild. And yeah, he was just absolutely like a complete nutbag. In fact, in the grand finals, he solidified the final round with a 4K. So I, I don't know. Like, the whole thing is just like crazy. It's something that you could make up and be like, that's so unlikely. Like, no team's ever going to go through that. And yet they somehow, <laughs> that somehow is their reality. You know the problem I've realised now? You know when you see something and you can't unsee it? You know when you posted that clip on, like, I can't remember if it was on Instagram or Twitter, you posted that clip of you when you're, like, 10 years old or something, interviewing your brother at, like, yes. some race car. <laughs> the problem with that is, now every That's time you lie. react really emotionally, I just think of that girl. Like, I imagine her just going, he fucking popped off! Man. He's fucking popping off! Like, Dude, that, that, the best thing... Because you, you're right, it, it looks like you were just, like... You were just like groomed to do this job or something like that. You were good. Well, he was quite good. The best thing about that clip is as like a side note is the bit where I, I'm interviewing my brother and I'm like, I'm like seven and my brother's like just younger than me. He's about yeah. a half, a year and a half younger than me. And I go, Kieran, look at the camera. Yeah, you have the wear, you actually have the wherewithal to know like your on camera presence is a deal. That's actually legit because people don't know that is one of the main things about being camera talent, isn't it? Yeah. Oh it's true. my God. That's legit. Oh, that was a while ago that I posted that as well. I'm amazed you that you remember that. It's <laughs> all right. Because, okay, what about that angle then? Because that's the other thing I was going to ask is this. Normally, when someone wins the tournament, it's pretty obvious who the MVP should be. Who do you think actually the MVP was for this tournament? Who would you have picked? Um, You know what? I actually don't remember who the... Uh, the MVP was Sugetsu, right? He got the MVP. I'll double check. I think so it was. So uh, they did a Twitter poll, which <laughs> the sad thing about Twitter polls is that you can only have four options. So four out of the five players are on this <laughs> oh, Twitter So poll. whoever gets left off just <laughs> looks like they're getting <laughs> flamed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, True. Yeah, true. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a really hard question because I think both... Oh, my God. I mean, so there are two different ways of looking at this. There he apparently looking, did get the MVP. He did okay, win it. He, he did, yeah. I thought it was him. Um, you can look at, like, the crazy performance within the grand finals, and I think that in that case, Sugetsu is very... Um, you know, deserving of that. Um, I think that you could also look at Shao for that as well, because I think that especially throughout the course of the playoffs, Shao got better and better. But I was really surprised at how few people voted for Angel. And I get it. It's like, especially with the Twitter poll and you've had someone who's had this really insane pop off like series and and performance and the fact that he's come into the playoffs and just the narrative really angle helps doesn't like, it yeah oh the God, idea yeah, he like, came last second yeah it's sure. insane like the narrative helps and cool. also like the fact that the way he plays is very like visually obvious if that makes sense but the thing with angel i think that that i would say that he's probably deserving of more credit is the fact that angel like did not do well in the group stage like he was really struggling his statistics were some of the worst in the entire tournament um and people were really concerned and he i think to get through that to have the uncertainty of the position of where your team is and not knowing who's going to be playing in the playoffs and how you're going to go about this, to have to IGL through that and also improve your own statistics enough that you can have a, a, um, a really competitive lower bracket run. I think the amount 
internally that Angel will have had to have gone through in his own head <coughs> to get the team to that point where they can make it to the grand finals and win is probably deserving of an MVP for like a playoffs run, let's say. Um, and obviously that's not something that's like necessarily provable in a server in the same way that like Sugetsu's performance is, for example. Um, so, you know, it's two sides of like a different coin and I understand why Sugetsu got it and I don't think he's undeserving of it, but I would have liked to have seen Angel get more credit for that because i think the number of people who voted angel in that poll was like the lowest of all four options i saw there was a different website actually like one of the community sites gave it to show actually so that's what i want to ask oh, was really? this in their team in fpx how would you describe to the layman like is this a unique setup in their team like obviously shows the initiator like who, who does like what's the sort of burden of carry as it were in their team who has to be the well, star do you think the burden of carry i think that's the crazy thing about fpx is like if you've got if someone like puts a gun to your head and says pick one carry from this team then i'm gonna get shot like you can't there isn't one carry but i think the the reputation that fpx really built for themselves this year even from very early in the year um is that they can play in so many different playstyles and they can they basically choose that playstyle rather unpredictably based on the situation that they are you know uh, handed um and that makes them very hard to prepare for and read into. Uh, I think uh, there was an interview with like one of the players. It might have been Angel um, for like one of the content pieces that they did for Masters. And he's like, good luck trying to prepare for what we're going to bring out. Because even we don't fucking know what we're going to bring out. Sure, until, the classic until joke, just before yeah, we do sure. it, right? It's sure. like, and th that's kind of been the, um, you know, the FPX MO, at least of this year. And right. I think that's really played into their success. So one of the like kind of great things about them is the fact that, yes, obviously everybody's playing the roles that they play. I mean, like, yeah, you're pretty much always going to see like artists as the duelist, for example. But there is that ability like f to have a lot of flexibility, I think, in this team and be able to pick up whatever you need to to play however you need to um, in the way that they see fit in the moment. The other thing that's wild as well is when you consider because they came through the lower bracket because they obviously lost immediately to Fnatic in the upper bracket. If you look at how many teams they actually played, they beat like eight teams in the whole tournament. Like if you look, they actually played like yeah. every favourite pretty much and beat them. Like this is a mega legit performance. So it was really interesting. Bala tweeted something um, just before the grand finals. It was like the day before the grand finals. And he said, to get to the grand finals, the fewest number of games you can do it in is four, and the maximum number of games you can do it in is nine. Paper Rex got to the grand finals in four games, and FPX got to the grand finals in nine games. So they, they were go. literally on the extreme ends yes. of what is possible to even get to the grand finals in. But I think that's what you mentioned there is like a very interesting thing about FPX because um, there, there are usually few teams that get the opportunity to face teams from basically every region. So they didn't face every single region because, like, for example, they didn't get to play against, like, Loud, right? So uh, uh, Yeah, it was basically they, only, like, LATAM, I think they missed, right? Right. Loud um, or Brazil. Yeah, those are the only two they missed, I think. But it was, like, kind of the big thing, you know, there are certain teams who have this kind of narrative that they haven't been able to play, like, a team from X or Y region um, on an international stage just because that's how brackets have gone sure. when they happen to have played. So, FPX, are, I mean, they might be the team that has played teams from the most regions, at least in, in one event. You'd have to really line them up against someone like Optic, who have been to a lot of events. Um and I think that that is a notable thing. I mean, yes, they had to play against both of their um, fellow regional teams in Guild and Fnatic. Um, so they played they played both of the EMEA teams. They actually played Fnatic a couple of times in this bracket. They played Guild once. Um, but yeah, they got to play against DRX, who beat them in the group stage, and they 2 0 them in the lower bracket. Um, you know, they got to play against Optic, who are obviously the incumbent champions up until this point. Um, and uh, that, again, like, is a kind of scary thing. Um, and then in the group stage, they played against like Zersha, North Eption as well. Um, two teams who come from um, various parts of the APAC, 
uh, region. Um, so yeah, they got to face a lot of different things. And I think even then, you consider the fact that because Paper X was the team that they were playing in the grand finals, Paper X probably could be attributed as having like the most unique play style oh, of sure, any yeah. any team right now. Um, and they <coughs> didn't come across them up to that point. So even though they'd faced all these teams of different play styles in different regions, they still had like the final boss as the final boss, right? And that could have been, it could have been like not enough, it, you know, and especially as it went to five maps, right? Like, um, so it, it, yeah, it goes to show what kind of like <laughs> variety and stuff there is. But I think that will come to be um, a big boon to them, especially as they obviously now have qualified for champions. So they'll be there. And, um, you know, having had, experience of playing all of these different teams i think will be a valuable thing going into that tournament so okay let's talk about paper x the team you were mentioning as i said on the last episode in some ways i actually think if you wanted like a pure narrative angle to make like the game seem exciting paper x winning vct would be amazing because basically it would signal to people from other fps games like this game isn't just europe and north america and in fact as you say they even have the most unique playing style i think it would be a brilliant sort of like storyline to break yeah. valorant out sort of a bit more mainstream and obviously the cool angle of like wow the best team in the world from fucking obviously in this case not a region at all associated with being elite in esports except maybe like Dota or something so I think yeah. it would have been a crazy storyline so what do you actually think like what essentially was it were they good enough to win this event you think they could have won on a different sort of day if they woke up and teams played a bit differently I mean would yeah, they be the I best actually, team I actually thought the Paper X were going to win this grand finals um I felt like FPX, I mean, as soon as FPX got to the lower round three, which was when they played against Fnatic, that's when I started to become unsure about how far I thought FPX were going to go beyond that. Because with Fnatic, it, it, assuming they beat Fnatic, which they did, uh, they were then going to have to face Optic, which is obviously a very difficult opponent. And I was just kind of like, you know, they've had a sort of tumultuous run through Masters so far, and it could go wrong at any point. Um, so I started to become a little bit unsure, but I had a lot of faith in Paper X because they just seemed very unstoppable. And I think the thing with Paper X is with their unique play style, um, it kind of almost didn't matter like how you performed against other teams because they were going to be their own beast. But I think that like the interesting thing about the way that this um, uh, game even went, I'm just getting the maps up from the game, um, is so the teams, I mean, pa like this is the crazy thing. Paper X with the upper bracket team. So they got to pick both bands which in theory should have been obviously like a huge advantage. Um, and they, like, FPX dominated Paper X on the first map, and it was Bind, which is a map that uh, FPX tried to avoid quite a lot, and that was that was Paper X's first pick as well. Um, so in theory, they should, you know... It's supposed to be a punish that, pick, yeah. Right, they would have thought that this was going to be where they'd have the biggest yeah, yeah. advantage, and it was a 13-3. And I think that if you're going to look at any map and say, okay, where should Paper X have done better at? It's probably that one. Um... FPX put 11 attack rounds together in a row without Paper X being able to do anything. Um, and obviously, yeah, you have to consider that the way the economy works is there's going to be opportunities within those 11 rounds for Paper X to be on even footing uh, with FPX, even if they're falling behind at certain points. But I think that Paper X have always been really um, heralded for their bind because of the way they use um, Forsaken on Yoru. Um, and that's always kind of been like the Paper <coughs> X thing. And Forsaken just didn't get <coughs> done on Yoru uh, in this map. And I don't know if that's, if that's a case of like them relying on Forsaken and therefore if he doesn't get something done like uh in the way that we kind of talk about yay in optic if yay's having a bad day i don't think the paper x rely on one person to the same extent um definitely didn't frag out like they'd expect though right no absolutely not like i just i literally have it right in front of me here he went six and 15 like you know it's just incredibly like meh, you know um so i think that that map was is probably the one that you would look at and be like that should have gone differently even if fpx were going to win that map it should never have been to that level um so that's probably the one that will hurt the most um for paper x but then um 
you know, it's interesting because I think that FPX's attack almost always came to be the the problem for Paper X. So I say like they put 11 attacking rounds together on bind um, against Paper X. We move on to Fracture, which was um, Paper X's map pick. That was map number three. And that was, that actually, I think was six and six of the half. Yeah, it was. So like the first half was like super even, could have gone either way. And as soon as FPX get onto their attacking half, oh, guess what? There is only one round that Paper X can put on the board. Then you go to Breeze, which was the final map. And this is the decider. Um, and again, it was FPX's attack in the last six, yeah, six rounds that um F uh, that prx couldn't break into so that really seemed to be the problem for them um and i think that to me that's you know says like okay there's this very specific thing that fpx managed to put against paper x but because we've never seen these two teams interact before we probably wouldn't have known that in advance, right? So it was still a very reasonable assumption to think that Paper X could have won or perhaps should have won. It just so happened that when this series actually then occurred, um, that there was this particular issue that Paper X were facing. Now, I think that's something that they can then look at, improve upon, and then come back at, at champions and be really good at you know like I, I don't think that's something that necessarily takes them out of the conversation of being one of the best teams in the world or could potentially be the best team in the world um but uh i think that fpx just judging how things were played deserved um this win i think that their play seemed <coughs> a little bit less like at times two-dimensional like i think that was the problem that with with paper x that i kind of felt like especially when they're relying on these compositions that are um you know these neon compositions which i i've said this with optic before is that the problem with neon compositions is they kind of suck on defense um and it feels like that same hole was kind of fallen into uh for paper x where you know, having your kind of trap card of, um, you know, being able to say, like, Forsaken Jingo kill, if that's not enough, then, like, there will be other factors that can then be exploited, and it seems that that's what FPX did. Looks like the Jing guy just for the whole tournament, like, he could have been the MVP as well if you give it to, like, the non-winner. Like, that guy looks like he just fragged out the whole fucking tournament. The stats are insane. Jing uh, has the high had the highest ACS Bonkers, of anyone, anyone who played in the whole thing. Um, and Jing's like a, a madman. Like you, you just watch him play, particularly Ray's, in my opinion, and it's just like is nuts. Um, and it's funny because I remember watching. Uh, it was like the plat chat episode that they did before the before the tournament even began, like before they all went to Copenhagen. And the only person who was really hardcore on the Jing train was Sideshow, and they were all kind of laughing at him for it. Okay. They're like, "Hey, he's good, but okay. like, come on!" And it's like, well, <laughs> he kind of got proven right here. Yeah, don't, what do they do with fucking Doubt and Sideshow? He's legit. <laughs> he's always got the fact he's got the he's got a good eye for the game. I actually think I just, I've always thought in Overwatch he had pretty good takes actually on who was good and who was not good, etc. By the way, one thing I want to ask you was this: I notice if you look at like late in the tournament when all these teams are playing. I mean, it's an, maybe it's an FPX quality. I don't know, but in all these big games, the upper bracket final, the final, the lower bracket. There's not many close games. Everything's like just whoever wins just stomps the other guy. It's like I'm 13-5, you win 13-5, then I win 13-4, you win 13-3. Like, holy shit, like where are the close the, games? One of the really weird things about this tournament was that like every fucking team seemed to take the other team's map and lose their own. Right. Like, right. I don't I haven't gone back to actually count how many instances that happened, but it seemed so like abundant. It happened all the fucking time and it was bizarre it was really really strange um and i don't i don't know why <laughs> but no it, it's true like i mean even just thinking like paper x and optic there was another like 13 3 there for paper x and it's like it feels really weird because this tournament felt close in a sense like if it, it, like could win, it was wide teams, open right yeah yeah it felt like there were teams who could have gone further like i mean fanatic arguably one, could yeah. have could have gone further fanatic were who i originally thought were going to win it um yeah. but 
you know, and in in the, the maybe game even where... DRX, who knows, right? Maybe even right. DRX could have gone further, yeah. Exactly, but it's like in the game where Fnatic got eliminated. Just looking at it now, this was a three map game. Two of those three maps, um, oh no, sorry, just one of the three maps was like overtime, and there were a bunch of overtime maps as well. So it's like there seemed to be really like it was rarer to see like a thirteen ten. It was yes. like either going to be like a 14-16 yeah. or it was going to be like a 13-5. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a good point that I hadn't really thought about. And you'll think about DRX, like, they're an interesting one for me because I feel like we always have, have this, where DRX, like, they don't make a deep run in the playoffs, they just make a run. You know, they're not going to be, like, first round. They're just a tease. It's like they show you just enough to make you think, oh, there's something there, but then they don't ever fucking finish, like you're saying, yeah, you know. Exactly, exactly. That's it. And I, it's just sort of like, it makes me wonder what the next step for DRX is. Like, do they just kind of keep going? I think, oh, who the fucking was it who suggested this? I swear I saw something on Twitter. It might have even been on the broadcast saying, like, DRX just need to come and, like, boot camp in Europe. For, like a month. Yeah, that would be a good like, idea. In NA. Like I said on a past episode, that is actually what the Counter-Strike teams used to do. They would try and come like before two or three lands and they would just, you know, boot camp for like two weeks in Sweden or Serbia or something. That would be a good idea because obviously you can level up sort of your experience of scrims and stuff. Yeah, so then you have have that like... Because, you know, for example, when we... um, When we had the, the episode where we had Paper Thin on, he was like... Well, you know, DRX versus Paper X, like they always beat Paper X. And I get it, they're scrim partners. But you know who DRX always lose to? EU and NA teams. And again, yeah. like that was the problem for them. They went down into the lower bracket to Optic and then they got eliminated by FPX. And it's like, eventually, because EU and NA get combined the most number of, of spots in any of these events, if you make it into the playoffs, you can't avoid them. Like You're going to oh, have gosh, to yeah. face EU and NA teams. And that always seems to be where DRX's run kind of ends. And it's like, well, we've got great players on this team. And clearly, you know, we talk a lot about how they drill things and they like to be very specific about the way that they play. But ultimately, it gets to that point where they just haven't been able to break through this ceiling that they've been stuck at um and it just kind of makes you wonder like what the next thing for them is because as you mentioned before there aren't tons of events that happen like last year there were four events this year there were three and it looks like that's going to be what the sort of um precedent and that's if is you even get forward. to the champions right it's like obviously the champions won't yeah, sort of implied like, you have to do some have, of the other ones yeah you have three yeah so there are two masters events and then and then Basically. champions which you have to qualify yeah. for um and i would say drx you know, would probably generally have a good chance of doing that because it, even if they don't like win anything, because they're basically just the the only real Korean representation. Like really they're the gonna get dominant. the circuit yeah. points from exactly. that from that region. Yep. Um, but yeah, you can't just keep hitting your head on this ceiling and just being like, oh well, we'll come back next time. But there might not always be a next time, um, and the number of next times is not a lot. So you need to be making really significant strides in these gaps between the events. And I feel like DRX aren't, like they might be making improvements based on like their own strengths and their domestic opponents, but you need to be making improvements that are actually going to help you in the international events. Otherwise you're just still going to get, you know, just, that's it. Like, if your aim as a team is to just qualify for the international events and that's good enough for you, then cool, great, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, but I doubt many pro players are satisfied with just that. By the way, what would you say about, like, the the state of Valorant as a competitive game? Because when I look at the top three teams in this tournament, it seems like like individual skill seems to have a massive effect on the game right now. Like, these are pretty, pretty stacked rosters that are going deep in these tournaments, right? Uh, yeah, they're stacked rosters, but then I think you can also point at teams that didn't get that far and also say they're stacked rosters. I mean, a really, really good example would be Loud. The fact that Loud went out as early as they did, they didn't even make the playoffs. Like, that was insane. We had an elimination match. The elimination match in the group stages, there was the grand finals yes. of the last fucking the event. Yeah. That's in- like, what the fuck? So, like... And you, you just can't look at Loud and be like, mm, yeah, they're just not a stacked roster. Like, yes, they are. So I think that, yeah, it's 
obviously fair to say that the top three teams and the the highest end teams are really stacked rosters. But I think it's more about how they like resource manage um, okay. and how they use those stacked rosters. Because I think that, I mean, look, like Valorant generally as a competitive scene is made up of like some portion of like previous Counter-Strike pros and then some portion of like young fucking gunner i was gonna say adderall filled gunners but i don't want to be making any <laughs> i'm not actually accusing anyone of taking adderall but like you see what i mean it's like these just crazy little like 18 year olds the that gives you a big pool of people from whom you could pluck a lot of stacked players or a lot of make of a lot of stacked rosters and have a lot of really really insane players so i don't think there is like a like a death of that in valorant i think it's more just becoming about the teams that can use those assets the best okay. and like we've talked about before in a lot of instances that's going to come down to um flexibility which is something that fpx are extremely good at and also like unique ways of looking at and exploiting the game so like Paper X would be a great example of that. You know, they have a unique way of playing and um, it makes it incredibly hard for people to deal with. Um, Optic, while I don't think they necessarily had the best individual performances of their lives at this event, I actually think that even though Optic got in the top three, they probably underperformed based on expectations. It seems like Ye is the only one who's up in the stats, isn't he? Like the rest of them are not right well, there. Well, Ye was up... Ye was doing okay in the playoffs, but in the group stage, Ye was like... At the very beginning of the the event, it was like, what is going on? Like, Ye is not performing. And it was it was very strange. So he needed like a little bit of time to kind of like get back into himself, I guess. It's not that Optic play poorly, obviously not. You can't make that argument. But I think that they just didn't look as exceptional as they usually do. Um, but their basis is still extremely high like their floor is super high right um but optic have, have also been one of these teams that have like pioneered new ways of playing and are um creative in the way that they approach the game um and so i think that that is just a very important factor um you can have you know like Yep, yeah, DRX, let's use them as an example. Buzz is is a really, really insane player. Um, and, I mean, someone who got spoken a lot about was RB, who, um, like, did some, was kind of questionable on some agents, but also, like, some of his performances were really good, and you can kind of tell this is a good player, but, like, are they utilizing him? Like, how they, you, you know, are going to get the best value out of him and stuff like that. Um and it's like, this is a stacked team, but they are not getting the same results as as those, you know, top three. And it's more because I think there just <coughs> isn't that same level of, like, creativity, flexibility, and, like, on-the-fly adaptation that we see in those um, much further up teams. Um, and I think I've always kind of believed that. Like, it, just having a, having a team of really good players isn't enough because otherwise all of these quote-unquote super teams that pop up in every fucking game would work, and they never do. True. So, yeah. like, it's just about getting the right combination. And also, I suspect that a lot of it comes down to the relationship that the coach has with the team and the way that the players can work with the coach to come up with ideas, whether that's just the IGL who has a really close relationship and there's sort of that intermediary um, or whatever it is. But I suspect that there has to be a lot of respect and trust and willingness to um, innovate or at least try new things, even if they might sound crazy at first, to actually get to that point. And that's something that we're never going to see as spectators. Oh, of course, yeah. Right, one thing I wanted to ask you was, would you actually say, like, a lot of the other past VCT events have been all about, like, a specific agent or, like, the metas hitting a certain way, who adapts? How would you describe this one? Was this, like, a bit more run of the mill? Was there anything specific that stands a lot out? Of, a lot of people played Neon. Um, I would say that Neon really showed up quite a bit. Um what do you think the impact I mean, of that was in general? Well, again, I think Neon's like an interesting agent because she's really good on attack if you can play her well, but she can be a bit more limited on 
defense. Um, and I mean, so for example, Paper X in this final uh, map of, of the grand finals, they pulled out this really like whack composition um, where they, so this is on Breeze, and they used Yoru, Neon, uh, Breach, Astra, and someone else, and I don't remember who the last one was. But they like just pulled all this like weird shit out. And it's like, this is a crazy composition that clearly they have thought a lot about, but like on defense just didn't do that much. Um, and it is interesting because FPX, the composition that they won that map on, was a composition that they haven't played since January. So they actually went back to this more like conservative, like sort of style of playing that's way less flashy and sort of based around new agents than than what we've seen in the last few months for the most part in Valorant, which I found quite fascinating that making that jump back did that. And I do wonder how teams are going to split off from here in terms of trying to focus on, yeah, let's continue down this road of like wild ideas. And if there are going to be some teams that sort of pull back and they're like, okay, this didn't actually serve us as well as we thought maybe it would. Like, what are some old ideas that we can implement now and how can we use those best? Um, and I am wondering if we will see a split of some kind um, as that happens. Um, I think like... Because, yeah, okay, so Neon came up a lot. Obviously, Chamber's still being played a lot. Um, we saw some Jet come back in. Um, obviously, she hasn't been super popular since she got nerfed. And so to see some teams still decide that they want to uh, bring her in. I mean, the fact that we saw, like, any Astra at all, I found so crazy. And Mind Freak did a really good job while playing yeah, Astra. Yeah. Um, and she is super out of the meta um, at the moment. But... I think this was the most, like, explosive that we've seen. Oh, really? I don't know if I would, like, put it down to just one specific agent. But I think, at least from what we've seen in 2022, because you can always, like, look back to, like, older Valorant where you had, like, the flash and dash kind of stuff <coughs> that was really pioneered by um, Vision Strikers at the time and um, and stuff like that. And, yeah, so, like, back then was obviously, like, quite explosive just by nature. But, um, yeah. Is there enough variety, do you think, of the agent pool? Like, do you think they should... Do you want more agents to be added? Is, is there enough for now where we could sort of, like take this set and have an interesting meta with it i think i think it's it's always cool to add new agents i think actually just to just to um add on to that last point um fade obviously was brought in a lot for this and and i i'm pretty sure that this was the first event where fade was available um and so she sort of provides a different way of like entering and initiating and gathering information, which is uh, obviously like a, a pretty big thing she pretty much gives you wall hacks right so that uh, I think really facilitates the ability to be more aggressive. And then if you're playing fast with something like a um, a neon or whatever, then uh, it's sort of understandable why you would have a like a way less slow way of playing. But I mean, obviously, I would I would love to see like more agents be be brought in because I think that's kind of how you build the game i don't necessarily think they need to, it needs to be done faster or slower than it has been done up until this point i assume that uh the the next agent that's going to be brought in i assume is going to be like a controller maybe i mean potentially a duelist but i think initiators i think there are more initiators in the game than any other role um and there's only really one agent in the game who's kind of considered unplayable which I would argue is a very good place to be because yeah, to yeah. have only one character in your game be unplayable is wild. And I think it would be nice for... Uh, so this is Phoenix we're talking about. It would be nice for Phoenix to get a rework um, maybe before a new agent is being brought in just so that, like... It, it's not even like he's niche. Because, like, you can say Yoru is niche now. It's not even like Phoenix is niche. He's just... There's just no purpose for him. Really, so because um, I don't really believe, like, I don't really believe in in the philosophy that like every agent has to 
be playable in every situation. But I do think that there should always be some instance where Agent A is better than Agent B. Uh, and Phoenix doesn't fit that right now. So yeah, maybe maybe like um, rework him before bringing in something new. Um, but I think it's a good thing to be building the game. I actually get more excited about new maps than I do new agents because right. I think new maps provide more of a broad way of finding new ways of looking at the game. And also I think that um, like strategy that revolves around map pools is very interesting. Um, and I think because the agents in Valorant are fairly well balanced, it it's always really viable for teens to have their own preferences and how they want to play. I don't see, at least anytime soon, Valorant getting into a sort of ghosts type situation where there are right. only like six agents you can play, you know? Um, so I think that new maps, for me personally, just always challenge the idea of like the correct slash not correct way of playing the game because it's a new geometry that you have to work Are you actually a fan generally of the Valorant maps, by the way? Because that's one thing we've never really properly talked about compared to the other games. We talk about things like map pool or veto. Because obviously the key thing is, if you know, that's one of the biggest complaints CSGO people have, by the way, about Valorant is they hate the maps. Like they hate the three sites. They hate the fact that like (laughs) they're so small compared to like CS maps, you know, like like if you ever go and watch the CS map, like Overpass, it's enormous. Like you could walk, like it's a joke how small the maps are in Valorant. So uh, what's your vibe in that sense? Because obviously some of that could be CS pros just grow, growing because it's a different game. Maybe the yeah, agents sure. making it. What do you think? Like, do you think that's uh, do the style of maps fit the game at the moment? Do you think? I think yeah. I think for me, like personally, in terms of my personal preferences, like my taste in maps has changed over the course of me playing the game. My favorite map was always Bind, which is quite a small map. And now I don't really like playing Bind that much, but I know that a lot of that is based around the fact that the agents I like to play um, don't necessarily like don't necessarily match what you would typically pick on Bind these days. If that right. makes sense. So like, I really really loved it during the Sky meta because I really enjoy playing Sky. Now Sky is still viable on Bind, but I prefer playing KO. Like I KO is my favorite agent in the whole game and I'm probably not going to pick KO in Bind. So I actually get more happy if a map comes up where KO is more viable because that's what I enjoy playing more and um then the playstyle that you kind of do with him um isn't necessarily what I'm going to find from that map. It is interesting because Split has obviously just been taken out of the rotation now that this event is over. And a lot of people are very unhappy about it because many people consider Split to be the best designed map in the whole game. Um, And I think the reason that people like Split a lot is because it's really, like lane based like the mid is very much its own separate thing and then each of the sites are their own lanes and the kind of channels that that join them um are well defined so a lot of people really enjoy that there isn't really like one site that is vastly preferable to the other um and to break into sites you do really have to um i mean having control of mid while also having control of the the main into a site is is very important so i think that split kind of fits this like ideal uh, idealized um sort of image that a lot of people have for a map just because of the way it's built um the funny thing is i never really enjoyed playing split that much but again that was mostly because the agents that I really enjoyed playing weren't necessarily as viable on split so i split was like the only map where i would roll switch Yeah, yeah um and yeah, I think that as more maps come out, we will end up with more variety in terms of map size and stuff. I mean, it was really interesting when Breeze first came out because Breeze was the first like big map, um, you know, and so a, a lot of people um, that was that was something new to get used to. And, and that's why a lot of teams didn't necessarily like the map at first because it was a new way of playing. It had big open spaces, so you needed longer range, um, you know, weapons. And, and the way you played had to be based around the fact that there are a lot of long angles and you would have to pick agent that's why after viper got nerfed it was still um viable to play viper on breeze because she still had utility that was the best at cutting off a lot of those long angles um 
But then Fracture is obviously a really big map, but Fracture isn't an open map. Fracture is a very closed map. So you would choose to play something like a race, for example, who can really punish tight spaces. So it doesn't necessarily feel... It feels like a big map when you want to be making rotations, because rotating in Fracture, if you're an attacker, takes a long time. But, like, you don't have that feeling of, you know, vastness that you do get in Breeze. Now, the newest map that's just been brought out, Pearl, is quite a small map. Um, and, you know, you want to rotate over to the B site from the A site. Like, it's going to take you, like, three seconds. But the way that the paths kind of go is that you're v quite likely to run into a defender slash attacker, um, whichever one you're not, while you're on your way. So it's that's probably going to be a map that I'd imagine that if that's what if what you just described as what the CS fans not liking and liking that you know, maybe wouldn't be so popular with them. But then I would hope that a new map would come out down the line, like not super far down the line, um, that would then be another big map. So you're going to get a lot of variety in them. And that's what um, that's what I like about it. I think that if you can kind of like nail decent level design, um, you know, and I think having like a good, well-defined midsection in the map usually goes down quite well because that's also why people like Ascent. Um, and obviously different kind of like levels and stuff that you can play on um, and stuff like that. I think that as long as those components are honored and you're not going too crazy in any of those, then you should be able to keep a lot of the maps within a sort of realm where you might not love one on this side of the realm, but you don't hate it. Like, it's still playable. Um, and the same over here. So kind of different tastes, different ways of playing without making anything too extreme. It's like Rainbow Six was very guilty of this, where there were some maps in Rainbow Six that were just really, really well designed, and there were some that just simply were not competitive, vi competitively viable. Um, and I think Valorant hasn't put out a map, at least yet, that isn't competitively viable. There might be maps that don't necessarily suit what you love right. as much, but they are all <coughs> competitively viable. And so I see, I personally see that as a win. Yeah, yeah. I will even say as well, if people don't know, Counter-Strike Global Offensive actually has a sort of a cheat advantage in that sense, which is that obviously it uses a lot of maps that the design existed in past versions of Counter-Strike. And so when CSGO came out, we just had good maps to begin with. Whereas actually, if people don't know, in the early days of the original Counter-Strike, because it was just whatever maps were in the game, we used to have some mad inappropriate maps we used in like World Championships and stuff where like like years later, these were just taken out the map pools and never brought back. Like they had no business yeah. being there because in general, my philosophy philosophy on maps is like this i don't want any one type of map like i hate in cs right for example people obsess over the idea that like if the map's like correctly done it should be like you know like you win as many rounds on like t and ct like it's that they think that's balanced like it's eight seven right. every half we have okay. max on 15 instead of 13 so it'd be equivalent of obviously like seven six every half right but the problem with that is like that's like a reductive philosophy because that's like that you're just thinking of one map thing what i want essentially is i want all types potentially of playing style to be not like the best but viable that's the key thing yeah. just if you could make it work with your team then I want there to be maps that are like super CT side you know I want there to be maps that are like all about like open defence I want maps that are like you have to be amazing with your utility to win because basically what I want is I want yeah. the players to decide who wins I always say the same thing about the maps I think it's really hard to design maps because to me again it's a similar thing a good map design is almost like you do a bunch of cool things but you don't know how it's going to be used you let the players figure out like they're going to do Which some amazing I think shit it, I yeah. think it's cool I always say like I Get, whenever I'm streaming, I get a lot of people who are like, um, you know, what do you think this thing needs to be changed in the game? Do you think this needs to be, what do you think of this nerf? What do you think of this buff? And I'm like, I kind of don't care. And it's not because I don't care, but it's because I will cast slash analyze slash play the game that is in front of me. And if that is the game that is handed in front of me, that is the game that I will learn and analyze and study and play um and unless there is something truly egregious slash broken which obviously like would need changing um and and i know that you know some developers will look at like very extreme wind deltas as well right and and that will be used to kind of slightly change things but for me i'm like I just I just care about you give me a game and I'll learn it. I don't I don't really have like a huge opinion on what that is. I just want to 
to take the game that you give me and and that be the basis of of everything that I'm like forming opinions around. I don't really care about having a super meta opinion on what the game actually is. I just just give me the game, right? Um, and that's why like I never had super like strong opinions back in Overwatch when you know I mean I actually liked the Goats era, but like when um, they started really like doing those kind of balances that led to a lot of meta changes in that kind of era and and people had super strong opinions about oh, it and course, i'm like yeah. i'm like dude this is just this is what the game is it has sort of naturally gotten to this point like i'm i'm less interested in soapboxing about what i think it should be and i'm more interested in looking at what teams do with this and like studying that and observing that like that to me is more fun than like worrying about like, well, what it should be. Well, it's not, is it? It's not that. So I don't know. Like I know, I think people who play the games at a really high level have a lot stronger feelings about this, oh, but sure, I yeah. don't. I'm not a great like gamer myself. I don't necessarily care to be either. So like for me, my priorities are maybe a little bit different in how I look at it. Um, but yeah, unless there's anything that's just like really broken about a game, I'm quite happy to just like sit back and just watch what people do. Like, I think it's fun to see people figure out new ways of doing things and how to use the game that they have been given to create victory. I actually even think that pros, because like obviously it's a classic thing in every game that has balance, that the pros constantly like hot take react to every balance. And yeah. usually it's mega hyperbolic. It's like, wow, they ruined the whole game. I'm like, wow, it's great now. Like it's always one extreme or the other. The other yeah. thing I would say is this, pros definitely get ahead of themselves in the sense that there's obviously a massive distinction as well between what's fun when you play the game and when you watch the same character being played by someone yeah. else. Because I've always thought that's an area that's me me mega underrated by pros. I know something might be annoying to you but unfortunately if that dynamic plays out and it's really awesome for us spectators we might want the game to stay like that i'm sorry like there might be maps you hate that we fucking love that's just the way the game works yeah i mean i will say this is where like i've always kind of like understood that i'm never going to be in the majority because using overwatch as the example again is i understand that a lot of people didn't like playing goats but also a lot of people didn't like watching it yeah that and was actually I, unique in that I sense no one liked it. watching it i loved watching it sure. i thought it was fascinating to watch but i understand that it was not an accessible way and not that overwatch is particularly accessible no, anyway no. but that it was, was not an extreme, an, yeah. it was not an accessible meta and so there with other than me enjoying it there was not really a huge benefit to it no um, no i mean what's but, funny about that if people don't know is that was that's a great example of exactly that's a perfect probably example of what we're talking about because i remember when that first came out i actually knew this would happen as well i knew that what would happen was because monte cristo was still in the game at the time i knew that on the one hand monty's gonna fucking love this meta because it, what's great about that meta so you don't, it's the ultimate analytical one I mean, in fact because he likes stuff it. like american football it's it's also one where you can look at the positions and how yes. they're getting the little edges out of this comp, etc. And you know what comp they're going to run. It's all execution. So the problem is, I knew for Monty, he's going to love it. But as you say, everyone else hated it. Even half yeah. the players hated it. Like, <laughs> Well, because what a lot of... And, and the, again, this is something that I recognize as being like, I'm, I'm not like other girls, where it's like okay. <laughs> a lot of people really, really more than anything in esports love watching an individual pop-off, like oh, a of mechanical yeah, pop-off. Yeah. For me, I don't really care that much about that. I like watching like a very smart team play. Um, and I get it, it's not as flashy. It doesn't like bring, yeah, yeah. you know, it's not a montage kind of level thing. But I just know that what I actually like the most watching and and appreciating about someone's gameplay is actually not in line with what the majority of people are like. So okay. like that's that's fine. Like I understand that I'm not necessarily um in the majority there but your original point about the fact that like what is slash isn't fun for the player is not necessarily in line with what makes good sport is true i think that does have to be a balance because if all of your players just fucking hate playing the game then you're yeah, sort sure. of you're starting sure. to lose like meaning right um but yeah no it's it's definitely true like it being a good sport is and should be the primary thing. Like, I'm sure that there are many traditional sports 
that you could go and scrutinize and be like, well, you know what? It'd probably be more fun if we changed this rule to something else. But it's just so, like, it deeply ingrained as part of the sport that, yeah, of course you understand that you can't just... I don't know, do something. Um, I mean, the classic example people always give would be like, we're lucky in Britain that we had all of our sports established before American TV because the joke is like, they would never let you have like a 45 minute half in football and something. The joke is they would have like <laughs> gamified it, wouldn't they? They would have had like, you know, there'd be like six quarters, you know what I mean? Like there'd be like oh the God. throwing section, the penalty, fa- they'd, they'd have all stupid gimmicks, wouldn't they? I know exactly. Yeah, yeah. no, exactly. So, it's, but it, it's just like, you know, to some people, if they went and like actually using this example, looked at football and were like, oh, well, you know what? Like, it could actually be, like, more fun if we, like, add all this, this yeah, little shit. But it's like, it's like, yeah, but that's not the game, is it? Because no, exactly. That would just yeah. wouldn't be, you know. I keep wanting to, like, use the example of, like, allowing players to fight each other, but that actually is a thing in hockey. So I'm just... Yeah, I'm that is true. Yeah. I'm just literally just using the example that already exists. Um, and the re- you could take that out of the game and probably save some people some concussions, but it's been accepted as it's part, of part of the game because it the makes sport. the sport yeah. better, right? Yeah, so it's absolutely. just sort of like, it's a, it's a kind of similar thing. And I think the other thing as well that I do sympathize a little more with, with pro players when they react quite strongly to changes in the game, is you, unless you're in like a re... And even then, like franchise leagues aren't safe, but... Um, you can kind of be dropped at any time. And if the role that you specialize in changes suddenly and the expectations change and what you have to be able to do changes and that no longer matches your skill set, like that could, it could threaten your career. Oh, for sure. It's like, you know, if, yeah, Yeah, if we're talking about like sport, like if I play, me specifically, if I play for some team as like a quarterback, they're not going to change the meta of football and suddenly quarterback quarterbacks be obsolete are they yeah, that's yeah. just not that's just not a thing no, so exactly. that is something that i do sympathize with for pro players because yeah absolutely like we've had this in in tons of games where oh, for sure that was in, all the time in league of legends in, i'll tell you that yeah well right but it's like in 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 first person shooters as an example like in uh in overwatch when gt dive became out of meta all of these tracer players are suddenly like they, they have to you know go and flex when uh, goats became a thing everyone had to fucking learn brig or zarya and then in uh you know in valorant it's like okay you had people who specialized in just playing jet but now the idea of just playing Jet sounds ridiculous because the game just isn't that way anymore. But when that first changed, there were probably a lot of people who shit their fucking pants about the oh, fact no that, doubt, yeah. oh, oh shit, like I'm a Jet specialist and now uh, that just isn't viable anymore. Um, and so, yeah, you have to keep up um, and and really be ahead of that. Otherwise, yes, your your career is going to be potentially threatened. And even if you do keep up with it, that does not necessarily say that you're going to be um, at the the right level of these new changes to keep your job anyway, even if you make the effort. So I can understand that there is an element of insecurity and fear that comes from it. And especially if a change is not considered one that people enjoy or like about the game and you then have to face the fact that your job could be in jeopardy in the name of something that you deem to be objectively shit like i'm sure that that's a really stressful place to be um but yeah obviously that's not something that necessarily affects me it's just trying to think of it from their perspective yeah, i can of understand course. that being a no, no, I'll even say as well, I actually expect that's even where you might even see more complaining in Valorant, because if you actually look, especially if people come from CSGO, that's going to be the rude awakening, isn't it? Like, the, oh, yeah. the difference is, you can gradually change the merit in CSGO, but as you say, you don't just wake up and find out, like, oh, there's no ops left anymore, mate, like, what? Yeah. I've been doing that for 10 years, like, yeah. there's none of that, like, whereas I, you're absolutely right, like, I mean, League of Legends, because it's a similar type of game, I can tell you, there absolutely are, like, amazing carry top laners, where the meta becomes you play a tank, and he either is just half as good at his job, or spoiler, he doesn't have a job anymore, and in comes the sub player, who's the tank player? Like that, that happens. In fact, if people don't even know, there've been like world championship teams that had subs like that that they brought in specifically for when the meta swapped. So, like, it's definitely a different vibe. Yeah, as I say, if you're in CSGO, you just you think it's on me, and it's my performance level is going to keep me in the job or not. But in this scenario, it's like you wake up one day and suddenly you're not playing what you were playing yesterday. You've got your, your homework. You've got to learn something new. 
Yeah. That must be very stressful. I've yeah. no doubt. I even think what's wild, I mean, we've talked about it on some of the past episodes. The craziest thing to me is this. In League of Legends, Geo, they have an excuse as to why they put the patches at really bad times, which is they're running the entire world of League of Legends. Like, obviously, like the Chinese League isn't exactly at the same time as the playoffs of the it's European hard to League. Find, like, yeah. You, so, in that one, I can give them some, like, a pass there. Like, in theory, you're always going to be fucking with someone. It's always going to be two before. global events a That's year. the problem. So right. The problem it's I have like... with Valorant is this. I don't want to hear, like, before the last Masters, where it's like, and of course, we're coming into a meta switch is like wait a minute a, a meta switch right at the end of the qualification part but before the land like whose idea is this like because logically if you're gonna have two lands like that i think you should just do it like we want in cs go for our breaks so here's the analogy the thing that fucks up cs go is when you have the like one month player break right because everyone's level gets reset so what we've okay. done now that hopefully they're going to do from now on is we've asked valve just put it after the major so it's sort of like the end of a cycle you know you play your tournaments you play the championship right. then you have your break then you come back because this i'd say do the patches the same way like i would have the patch right after vct masters like why not make vct masters be the last tournament on that patch and then swap to the next patch you know what i mean yeah no i agree like i there are <laughs> the regions are mostly following the same sort of look schedule. fairly similar I think yeah. some of them like are a couple of weeks out from each other i think korea was like two weeks earlier or something but yeah it's generally the same yeah because it was wasn't it like with the big meta shift that happened at the end of stage one it was like NA played their last week on the new yes. mesh, uh, on the new patch, but EU had already finished or something. And then I it was like, so, yes. not only did NA have to then, you know, learn that new patch, but then it could also be considered an advantage after that because they're already used to it by the time that the event yeah, rolls yeah. around. Um, I, Whenever this topic of conversation comes out, my first thought is always, I do not envy the person who has to make the decisions, like, at the, the, oh, the, for the sure. fucking yes. publisher. They're to... damned if they do and damned if they don't, yeah, absolutely, no, like, yes. I would, yeah. not want, I would not want that job. Um, but... Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, yeah, this was something that Ubisoft were always very guilty of, was, like, bringing out a new patch right before an event. Like, oh, it was, man. like, really, really, really bad timing. Um, I, I agree that, in general, I think that patches should aim to come out after a global event, but um, I'm sure there are, like, logistical parts of it that make that not as simple as it is to just yeah, of course. stay, right? That's one um, thing you always have to add into these conversations as well, because pros especially get way too much in their bag of, like, I'm a pro and I'm entitled. One thing you have to say is what you said there. It was, to be fair, it's really hard to balance things as well. Like, yeah. even if each individual idea is right, the question is, what's the knock-on effect? Like, I always say to people, balancing's like fucking whack-a-mole. You hit the two moles here and five pop up behind and you're like you're never going to perfectly nail it all like you know you no one could even keep that like, many variables in your mind you know at once uh, obviously this is just like um me speculating i don't really know what goes on in in sort of like the um the process of doing all of this but i i wonder as well it's like not only is there like the esports uh, obviously as the esports fans and people who work in esports we want that to be the priority but i'm sure that also like from a from the marketing side of things for the majority of people who play the game that's also on its own timeline which may oh, not always sure. match up to the yeah, esports yeah. and that is a very tough pill to swallow i think for a lot of esports fans is that the esport is usually not the financial priority no, no. for the for the publisher typically um, hasn't been for riot as well because they make so much money off like league of legends the game so yeah traditionally yeah. that that's absolutely the way it's been so, i'd even say as well the other thing people really misunderstand is this you actually also have to ask yourself that about riot right which is who are they trying to serve are they actually trying to serve those of us who play the competitive game or just the random people who play casually because obviously way more casual games than the casual, e the, tournaments. Casual, yeah. the casual players usually make more money for a publisher right i've no doubt yeah all like, the skins are I, all that shite yeah it, exactly like i i believe in balancing a game around the pro level because i think that represents the closest to correct way of playing the game that you're going to get but i try to not be entitled about expecting everything else to be done around the pro scene because as much as i would love that in my ideal world um i don't think the pro scene are the most probably the most profitable part no, of any no, of, of anything and so no, no. like you know there will be people at the company who uh who are probably really really want that but you tell that to the shareholders and they're going to tell you to fuck off so Absolutely. um you know it's a it's a difficult one because yeah it's very easy to be like oh yeah here's here would be the best times to do the patches and it's like that might not because for example so with valorant right now they're um delaying the next patch because they're doing an engine update 
And so I read uh, the whole thread about it on Twitter, which was actually quite interesting as someone who doesn't really know how engines work. But um, they're doing the engine update. And so that's going to be that's going to take a little bit of time. And then, you know, they'll release a patch, which is basically just you. I think the idea is that you don't really notice it as the player, but the game has been updated to match the engine update. And then I'm sure that there is probably a um, certain amount of time after that patch where the following patch is going to come out right and so the fact that this one has been on a delay because it's a different kind of patch that probably changes the timeline in and of itself for the the one after that and like i guess that will be after champions because champions is in september for valorant um so i i don't know when that'll be but like just even little things like that like they literally have to rebuild so many parts of the game to match the right. unreal engine <laughs> update you know and it's like well you can't you know there's what they're gonna do. They're gonna write to Unreal Engine and be like, "Can you please just not update your engine for now? Because we've got an event." Like that just. Oh, by the way, well there's like the other thing that I know is very like this might actually be interesting info for people who don't know this. I know from League of Legends side of things because I once had an episode. It was on my show I did with Loco Doco called Listen Loco, where we had a guy called. If you look at it, we'll call me like Riot Blastoise or something. It's a guy who works for Riot as part, I think, of like the balance and design team and that. And basically, one of the things he explained to me, and I'll admit as an industry person, I didn't know this, but it's super. Cool complicated so in league of legends i don't know exactly for valorant they'll have some equivalent i'm sure in league of legends basically this is how they do it, it sounds complicated but they have the current version of the game that everyone's playing now if you just log in league of legends but then they have like when they're making the next patch they have a, a live environment the like pro environment where you can play just the patch it's like being part of a beta basically you can go yeah. and just test that out and the problem is it's all about the timing of like how long is it in like the test version where people yeah, can like give you feedback version. But then how long before it then comes out and then how long before it gets cycled for the next patch? And basically, that's what also makes it complicated. We're talking like they just make it like a fucking cake in some oven and then come right, out, there like, you go, yeah. enjoy the care. But it's not, it's this whole process of back and forth and it's the timing and when does it drop and then when does the next cycle phase? And so it's actually, again, it's really complicated, actually. It sounds, sounds really tricky to actually know, essentially, like how do I use this feedback of the people playing the beta, but then the people who designed right. it, but then the people who've, uh, I mean, half the joke about, by the way, pros reacting. Pros will also react with a hot take just on the patch notes. They haven't even played the champion yet. You know what I mean? Like, they'll be like, this right. is broken. So you haven't even played it? What? Like, cause, yeah, that's just not, it is entertainment, but we I are just, ridiculous. We I, are ridiculous in esports, are we? So my, my, <laughs> my thing, and I, I almost feel like embarrassed whenever I admit this because I feel like as somebody who works in esports, I shouldn't be admitting this, but Come on. I very rarely read patch notes. I always wait for the patch to come out and then a a assess the general reaction from that and also my own my own like experience in, in trying it. I never bother reading patch notes because I kind of don't really care. Like, it, it, again, this goes back to I will play the game that's in front of me, right? If this is not the game I have to deal with right now, then I just don't give a shit. It takes up brain space for me to like read it, try and remember it, form an opinion on it, which is going to mean absolutely fucking nothing course, before, yeah, exactly. before it actually comes out. I just, I know that like, people really really care about patch notes because obviously like they're really invested and it tells you about what's going to happen with the game um and everyone like it's it's one of my pet hates it's like in esports as an analyst they'll be like oh you know what teams do you think are going to be really affected by this yeah, i don't sure. care i just want to wait like let's wait until the patch is actually out because they might change the patch between now sure. and then anyway and then i can give you an opinion and i will actually give a shit because that's the game that we'll be like working with i don't i just don't care i just don't care i really like don't care about patch notes well, listen, I think we all got the sentiment at the end there. Gio yeah, doesn't I, care about patch. I'll probably put that as the title of the video. I'll just say as a random aside, because the, the best example ever I've seen of this was way back in the day in early League of Legends, the classic double lift, right? Double lift was there with his old mate, Travis Gaffer, doing an interview. So they haven't fucking changed the habit of a lifetime on that one, have they? They've done about a thousand of those, bro. Okay. <laughs> this was like, you know, the interview 180 or whatever. And this was in like the first season when they did LCS. And I can't remember what champion it was. It might have been like Draven or something ridiculous like that. And 
and there was just a champion. And this is what's hilarious. Doublelift hadn't even played this. I don't even know if he'd seen like a video of it doing the abilities. He'd just heard like the description of what Draven did. And because he's Doublelift, instead of just being like, well, that sounds a bit broken, he obviously was just like, this sounds shit. And then Riot was like really offended, obviously, because they were like, bro, it hasn't even come out yet. Like, how can you flame it? Like, and then the best thing Aww. is, because this is like the early days of LCS, I think he even had to like do an apology or something like, I apologize for my unprofessional. I think he even had to do one of those. Like, even though, by the way, didn't he have to do that recently for a co-stream uh, listen it's double if he has to fucking apologise all the time <laughs> like he is the sort of person you have to understand who just he, it's not even that he like speaks faster than he thinks I think sometimes he just speaks you know <laughs> just who he is he's one of those guys sure. as someone who's I've mastered it here's the thing double if I've got the PhD course you're still you're like a freshman on this shit hit me up I'll tell you how you master saying things that will get you in trouble but at least know what you're going to say at least have some fucking forethought and also by the way I mean, he was wrong that champion's alright it's not good it's just alright innit just leave on that. <laughs> this video was supported by Kill Your Inner Loser, Travis Goff, Ahmed Haju, Matt Pognaccio Racula, Hades, Animosity, Joseph Ginsburg, Tobias Bernasconi, Bot Pounder 420, Jensen Gore, Kovacevic, Percy, Tosh, Adam Ox, Tukan, and a special thanks always goes out to Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Do you want to ask me a question of one of my monthly AMAs? Do you want teasers to find out who the upcoming guests are? Or maybe you want to take part in one of those lengthy esports discussions with moi? Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Scroluminati today via the Patreon link in the description box below.